Thank you very much for uh, coming. I think we have a, a quite an interesting topic today. My name is uh, Rick Truscott. I'm the, uh, the chairman of the Energy Committee for the American Chamber. This is the, the third of, of kind of a three-step process and all in, in, in relation to the, um, the government paper and requesting for opinions of the future market structure of the electricity market here in Hong Kong. Uh, we began with some, some consultants. We had a gentleman by the name of Amory Lovins from uh, the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute. And he talked about uh, a lot of renewable energy power and a lot of options there. Uh, we had a, another regulatory expert that spoke. Most of those were in March. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had Mr. Do Donald Ng from the government to talk about uh, the government's position and their thoughts. Today, I th actually, I think it's the most uh, exciting of all of them. Um, we have uh, Mr. Paul Poon, Managing Director of uh, CLP Power Hong Kong, and Mr. C.T. Wan, uh, Managing Director of Hong Kong Electrica Investments here in Hong Kong as well. And so we'll hear their, their uh, opinions and their thoughts on, on the, the government consultation. Um, a couple things, just a little bit of housekeeping. First off, if you have a, a hand phone or, or an electronic device, like I'm sure everybody has at least one of them, <laughs> please switch them to, to, to silence or, or to vibrate mode so it doesn't interrupt uh, the speakers. Um, next thing, and this is something as, a, as an American Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, chairman of the, uh, the, the committee, I'm obligated to make sure that you try to all join the American Chamber. So if you <laughs> look at your badges, if you have a gray badge, that may be kind of indicative of your mood not being so happy, we'd like to change it to a blue badge. <laughs> And those are the members for the, the American Chamber. We have some others. We have a, a number of uh, uh, board of directors here that are also in attendance, and those you can see uh, by the red badges that they're wearing. Um, I also would like to, to, to thank, we also have the German Chamber of Commerce that has also supported today's event, so we'd like to, to do that. Um, now, I, I'd like to just very quickly introduce the, the head table, um, and I'll just start, I have to start with somebody, my boss, Mr. Paul Poon, Managing Director from CLP Power Hong Kong. To his left is Mr. C.T. Wan, Managing Director of Hong Kong Electric. <laughs> to his left is Mr. Jim Taylor. He's also the Chairman of the Environmental Committee here for the American Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Colin Tam as a Governor for the uh, American Chamber as well as the Chairman of the Crystal Vision Energy. <laughs> Mr. Jonathan Lamb, he's the Vice General Manager for TUV Rhineland. Thank you. Mr. Sean Purdy, he's also, he's the uh, vice chair here for the Energy Committee of the American Chamber. He's also managing director for Power Division of Asia, pa Asia Pacific for ERM, Environmental Consultancy. Next to him is Mr. Shani Che, Regional Sales Director of Taiwan and Hong Kong for Rockwell Automation. <laughs> and next to him is Mr. Paul Che, the, the chairman of the uh, American Chamber of Commerce from Macau. We're lucky to have him here today. And the last is Mr. Donald Austin, definitely not the least. He's the Managing Director of Austin, uh, Austin Pacific. He's also the, uh, the, uh, the Governor on the Board of American Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> now, the, the, the kind of the agenda of what we'll do today is, is we'll start eating. And about halfway through, we're, we're going to interrupt your, your, your lunch to have uh, the two speakers speak. And I'll introduce them more in, in detail at that point. Um, so at this point, we'll, we'll start eating. And I won't say anything until the middle of your lunch. Thank you. <laughs> what I'd like to do is, is we're gonna, the two speakers are going to speak in a moment. The government has issued a, a, a paper requesting for people's opinions, and, and we would like to encourage you to submit those papers to the, to the government. If they do listen to them. Last year, we, we did a similar exercise in regards to the fuel mix, um, and a number of responses, and, and the government did uh, take those into consideration. The questions that they've asked this year really is about the future structure. One thing about the paper, it talks about what people of Hong Kong actually have right now, and that is high reliability, low cost, especially when you consider, look at the, the markets around the world. So the, the, the government recognizes that in, 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 the, in the paper, and they've effectively proposing the extension of the existing scheme of control regulations. Now, there's some fine points of the details, and I'm sure the two speakers will elaborate on those. Uh, one of them is the return, the duration, and so on. So there are some, some quite interesting points that are raised in the, uh, the, the consultation paper. 
Today, what we're going to have is we're going to have the two heads of the two iconic supply companies here in Hong Kong uh, speak to the, the future fuel mix. The first one I'm going to introduce is, is, is my boss, Mr. Paul Poon, the Managing Director of CLP Power Hong Kong. I'm, I'm sure many of you have had the opportunity to meet Paul. He's been involved in the electricity se sector for um, 37 years, not only in Hong Kong, but also internationally. Um, one of the projects that, uh, one of the first international projects CLP did was in Taiwan, and Paul was instrumental in, in getting that project uh, financed and under operation. He uh, has been the managing director of CLP Power Hong Kong, which is the regulated business, for the last two years. Prior to that, he was the chief operating officer, and before that, he was the, the director of power systems, which is actually my current position. Um, with no longer, uh, I'll stop my introduction, and Paul, Please, I'd like to, to hear your, your, your views. Please welcome Paul. Uh, thank you, Rick, for your kind introduction. CT and I are delighted to be able to, to have the opportunity to speak to the American Chamber because uh, we think that this is an uh, important topic for the whole of Hong Kong. So it's a uh, good for us to have an uh, opportunity to share with you on our views. The first question we would like to ask is, is Hong Kong very unique as compared with the rest of the world? And I think we, we are living here, so we all know Hong Kong very well. And of course, we know that there are many, many features that Hong Kong is different from other places in the world. But one thing is really unique. Is, uh, Hong Kong is an extreme vertical city. And if you look at the chart on your uh, uh, right-hand side, the skyline ranking, I don't know many of you have heard about it. And uh, if you just look at uh, this uh, skyline, you understand that means the high-rise buildings, uh, a measure of the high-rise building. And Hong Kong low surprise is ranked number one. But most Surprising is the second place, New York City, is only about one third of that of Hong Kong. And if you go further down, Singapore is one sixth of Hong Kong. So this is a measurement of how vertical we are. That means every day we have to rely on the vertical transportation. And imagine if you are living on the 60th floor, and if you do lose your supply, you have a safety issue because I don't think anybody can rescue you if you have a heart attack. So this is Hong Kong. And if you look at all other cities, all other cities, they really don't have this unique feature. And of course, uh, we have other statistics supply, supporting our demand for high reliability. For example, the number of passengers traveling on the underground, the number of uh, a passenger leaving the airport, all this are relying on a highly reliable power supply. The second unique feature I put up here is Hong Kong has to import all its energy. So in a way that our electricity, which is produced by energy, uh, by raw energy, is not under our full control. It's subject to international prices. So these are the two key points I wish to highlight in the beginning, and that will be supplemented a little bit later. Now let's look back at the consultation. This uh, color is yellow. I don't know why it's using yellow as the color, which is <laughs> quite politically sensitive. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, it doesn't mean anything, I think. <laughs> and uh, I outline here four major points on, the, on this document. First, I think is rightly point out that the scheme of control has served the energy objective. All four of them, safety, reliability, affordability, and environmental. All these four has served well. But of course, there's always room for improvement as we move on. And on competition, and uh, you say very clearly that it doesn't not necessarily drive down tariff or increase reliability, but does allow more customer choice. And I will come back to that mean the, the customer choice, because this is uh, another important point. On the readiness for competition, is that 
clearly that Hong Kong does not have the prerequisite for competition by 2018, but we can do some study or preparatory work for the future. And last but not the least, on the Hong Kong Future Filmix, if you do remember that, uh, at the same time last year, Hong Kong have conducted this uh, consultation on the fil Future Filmix, and two options were proposed. And finally, it's overwhelming that majority supporting the option two, which is local gas fire generation, to meet the future uh, carbon intensity reduction target, as well as the future demand. Right, now let's uh, again step back on what does really the scheme of control uh, want Hong, the two power, company, two power company to deliver. And this energy trilemma, I think you have heard about it many times. Uh, it's slightly different from in the consultation document. It puts safety and reliability together. But we try to group the two, two together be, because we think that safety comes with reliability. And out of all these three, you can say, KPI, we have all delivered them well. We have excellent uh, safety record and world-class supply reliability. I think we all recognize it. If you ask yourself, when do you, ex when do you experience your last supply interruption? I think most of you cannot remember in this room. On the emission side, we have reduced our emission by over 80%, despite our energy growth has increased by 80% also. That was since 1990. So that is quite remarkable. And actually, you can see that we have seen more blue skies than before. And uh, in terms of emission pollution, we are allowed the third place now after road transportation a marine. A marine. And uh, number four is catching us up now. Uh, on the tariff side, our tariff is one of the lowest in the world compared with people like New York, London, Singapore, uh, and uh, other major metro metropolitan cities. We are about maybe sometimes it could be two and a half times lower than that of similar metropolitan city. And I think one of the very recent ones is this uh, global competitive report issued uh, by the World Economic Council. And Hong Kong is ranked number one. And one of the key points is in terms of quality of energy supply, Hong Kong is ranked number one out of 148 countries. So this is really remarkable. And this is internationally recognized. I think this is a very important point that Hong Kong, despite we don't have natural resources, we are so compact, but yet our quality of energy supply is ranked number one in the world. Now, as I said, we talk about choices and competition. So I would like to throw out a few questions. For example, does competition lead to lower tariff? A lot of people think that, oh, yes, of course. We think that competition could bring to lower tariff. But if you look at what has really happened elsewhere in the world, for example, in the US, say, there's maybe half of the sort of a country is with regulated uh, uh, power in the, in the regulated industry, but another half is not. But you, we usually see that the retail prices in the deregulated states are higher than those in the regulated state. So that is the truth. And if you look wider in the world, UK, Australia, Singapore, all this has much higher tariff than Hong Kong. And most of these places see a small drop in the tariff when competition was introduced. But later, it rebounds significantly and leading to this uh, tariff spikes. And the second question is, would competition bring choices? Would competition bring higher customer satisfaction? Good questions again. So let's look at, again, the history, the, the, uh, uh, what was uh, happening elsewhere. In Australia, we see that there's a lot of customer switching between supplier. But at the same time, the complaints have rapidly increasing because they mistrust. You know, when there's competition, a lot of people will be trying to sell you their product and services. But they, you usually oversold 
what they have promised, and eventually that led to complaint. And likewise for UK, they introduced the retail competition since the 1990s, and they are now having the highest number of complaint, and even. The UK Competition and Market Authority is undertaking a review of this competitive market in, as a re response to this mounting pressure from the customer complaints. So these two areas, I think we can see that it doesn't mean the choices and customer satisfaction. And the last point, I think, is the most important because we talk about Hong Kong's uh, so complexity reliability is the most important. So no way we could compromise on our supply reliability. But if you look at the UK, they forecast this winter, they will have only 2% reserve margin, only 2%. This is just because that over the years, they have not been able to attract sufficient investment to provide sufficient generation capacity to meet the future demand. This is as simple as that. So now recently they quickly try to create this capacity market to encourage investment by guaranteeing a long-term return, similar to the scheme of control now. So they go back to the square one and introduce the, uh, as a sort of a, to uh, make sure that they have sufficient generation capacity. And likewise in the US, you have remembered the California electricity crisis and also now they are also doing something similar to the UK to encourage investment in response to the falling reserve margin. And Hong Kong now have a reserve margin of around 26% in CLP, which is quite a healthy uh, number compared with the world standard of 20 to 25%. So in short, if you want to introduce competition, you need to ask yourself, what do you really want? If you want, if you want lower tariff, if do you want a, a higher reliability, do you want a better customer services, or you want just as choices, just uh, the name of more choices? Now let's focus on this uh, consultation document, and there's, there are a number of discussion points which we would like to share with you our views. First is on the duration. A lot of people say that. This uh, scheme of control agreement is, uh, could be maybe too long, so they are proposing 10 plus 5 years. But you, if you think about our long-term investment, our usual asset life is between 30 to 60 years. And in some particular case, like the cable tunnel, is 100 years. So it's basically three generations of human beings. We are talking about such a long duration of asset life before you can depreciate your asset. And if you have a very short contract duration, it will create a lot of uncertainty, both for planning and investment. And more importantly is of course now, our project are really complex. To implement a significant project, 10 year lead time is almost a must now. Usually it will be even longer if you look at some of the projects happening in Hong Kong. All the projects are running into a very long lead time. And going back to the return, I think our point is a reasonable return and regulatory certainty are important factor in attracting sufficient investment. In other words, if you have a regulatory regime which is reviewed every 10 years, once every 10 years, and every time you talk about a small, a lower return number. Does it give comfort to the investor? If you are an investor, and if you have uh, put something in the ground or building a substation, which have an asset life of 50 years, do you want to invest? You have to ask yourself. So we think that the return has to be reasonable. Otherwise, it won't be able to attract sufficient investment. Simple example is the UK. And of course, we have to maintain our supply reliability as well as our environmental requirement. These are the two essential things we need to maintain. And we also need to look at the whole package itself. Return is just one of the number 
For example, you look at the duration, you look, look at the risk, you look at the interest rate, all this. This is the whole packet you should look at when you finally the return. And it's now just too early to come back. But I think eventually we will come to this point later. There are two other questions on the tariff approval and fuel cost arrangement. I would like to emphasize here that actually under the current arrangement, there is a lot of government oversight on the tariff. For example, in the development plan, in the auditing review, in the tariff review. All this gives the government a scrutiny on the tariff and there is no short of scrutiny over in the, in the process. And I mentioned at the beginning that Hong Kong has no indigenous fuel. So all the fuel has to be imported. And the fuel mix is decided by the government. So in a way that we have a very little freedom to choose a low cost fuel because of the fuel mix requirement or because of the emission requirement. And we are very transparent. We publish all our fuel information on the web. And also we publish the fuel information at every tariff we will. So in a nutshell, we can explore whether the existing oversight are sufficient or not. But we have reservation over any arrangement that disallow that any cost that have been properly and prudently incurred. So that's our will on the tariff rule approval and the fuel cost arrangement. On the incentive and penalty, this is not uncommon elsewhere in the world. We have seen this in the UK, in Australia, in the US. And so we, we don't think this is something new. But we, we would like to emphasize that this should be served to encourage outperformance. In other words, you should encourage our upward performance. And you should have a balanced and reasonable incentive structure to deliver benefit to the customer and the company. That means both the customer and the company should benefit. And on the renewable energy, I think this is a very, very hot topic recently. Many people talk about Hong Kong should have more renewable energy, which we support. No doubt we support renewable energy. We think that renewable energy should be uh, sort of uh, exp explored as far as much, as much as possible. But let's look at the reality. For example, if we cover 18 of the Victoria Park by PV panel, it would generate 1% of Hong Kong electricity lead. And we have a real example is our PV installation in Tang Island. And if you have been there, you can see this is quite a big island. We installed two solar farms with wind turbine also, so the two in red circle. And this big solar farm is good for only 70 people in the island. And they are under, always under electricity rationing because you only have electricity when the wind blows, when the sun shines. So that is the reality. And uh, so we will encourage renewable energy, but we have to recognize the constraint that Hong Kong have all, only 1,000 square kilometer of land with 7 million of people, and over 70% of them are kind of country park. And also, of course, we have understand renewable energy have cost implication because sometimes it will be the poor will be subsidizing the rich for renewable energy. But in the end, we still be encouraging any renewable energy, and we will try to put forward some new suggestion in our response to the consultation document. Another important point is on the demand side management and energy efficiency. CLP truly believe that energy should only be used when it's required to use. It should not be waste. So we always strongly believe in energy efficiency and demand side management. And so far, we have delivered many E and C schemes. For example, if you know recently, we have the Eco Building Fund, which we subsidize half of the resi residential building to upgrade its facility to a more high, higher energy efficiency uh, appliances. We also uh, have this uh, Power Your Love program, which encourage people to save energy and the shareholder will subsidize, put the, put the uh, save the energy for the people in need. And uh, in our consultation document, we will also mention our smart meter. We think that 
smart meter is a key enabler for Hong Kong to be more energy efficiency and to go and to proceed with more demand response. And I think you know that smart meter is a sort of a digital meter which offer a great variety of uh, features and it can record your consumption every 15 or 30 minutes. So the key point is it provides the information of your consumption. It has a communication channel to enable you to know how much energy you are using so that you can save your energy uh, at, uh, when, when required. And also, we can use this for demand response. For example, during the one or two hottest day in the year, when the demand sort of uh, shoots up, we will provide incentive for the customer to reduce the energy consumption. And for example, we will pay you 10 times per unit of the kilowatt hour to, that you have saved. As a result that, for example, if you save one kilowatt hour of electricity, not only you don't need to pay for the one, one kilowatt hour, but we will pay you 10 times back. So it's $10. It's uh, better to go, than go, going to Macau. <laughs> it's, uh, you seldom have uh, one to 10 bed. I think we have a friend Paul from Macau and we have reference it. So, but we found that in our pilot scheme is very effective. And that's why we think that smart meter should be one of the ways that to enable our ENC and demand response in the future. Now, as a summary, I would like to point out that everything we do has to be sustainable. This is very important. Whether this is the regulatory regime, whether this is the environmental performance, whether this, uh, we are designing our future program in terms of ENC, RE, and uh, demand response. We have to be make sure everything is sustainable and will be best for the Hong Kong. And uh, if you look back, the system of control has served Hong Kong well by providing superb reliability and also improving environmental performance and our tariff is one of the lowest in the world. And this achievement should not be compromised, but the scheme of control can continue to be adapt to the changing need. And of course, we are willing to work with the relevant party to take forward any changes or any streamlining of the uh, scheme of control agreement that will be required. And meanwhile, we will work with the relevant party to meet the 220 emission target and uh, as well as trying to see which elements in the regulatory arrangement has to be considered in order to maintain our reliability, environmental performance, and tariff uh, affordability. So we welcome your views, and we still have uh, about two weeks to go. Please make your voice heard and respond to the consultation document. We need all your voice to be heard, whether this is you agree with me or not, but doesn't matter. Please make sure that you submit your response and keep, uh, let your voice heard and, uh, so that Hong Kong can have a sustainable uh, electricity power industry in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, now, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Mr. C.T. Wan, who's the managing director of the Hong Kong Electric Company. Um, also very experienced in the electricity sector with over 40 years, professional uh, electrical engineer. Interesting enough, he's also been quite involved. He was the chief executive officer of dis two distribution businesses in, in Australia, uh, PowerCore and City Power. So he has a lot of experience not only in Hong Kong but around the world in, in this business. Uh, currently, he's serving as a director of a number of energy businesses in China, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and in Canada. No further introduction is necessary. Please welcome uh, Mr. C.T. Wan.
thank you, Rick. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, giving us uh, opportunity to speak to you about the government's consultation on the uh, future electricity market in Hong Kong. I also need to thank Paul. Uh, he speak on every item of the consultation, then save me a lot of work. <laughs> so I, I'm doing a very lazy way of presentation. I, I, my presentation has two parts. The first part actually run through the 19 slides that government used to present this to, uh, I, I think they, they have presented to our main chamber and uh, general chamber and other chambers of, and so on and other stakeholders. So I will use it and just make a few comments on the uh, government's uh, presentation. And then I have five slides talking about what are the wheels of Hong Kong Electric. Uh, this is uh, slide two. Uh, that's the, where the government start off by saying why they need the, the consultation. Very important point is the scheme of control uh, 10 years will expire in 2018, but this year is a very important year to decide what are we going to do in the next five years. So I only met, I have one comment. The green part is uh, done by us. So I only say the existing regulatory framework has successfully achieved the four energy policy objectives set by the government. I think Paul already mentioned with very uh, uh, certain uh, numbers and so on. The second one is on where are we now? Um, the four objective uh, means safety and reliability. This is the first two. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, Paul also mentioned about the uh, reliability that Hong Kong used to enjoy. Uh, Hong Kong Electric have six nines. In actual fact, we only have 99.99986. We don't have six nine yet, but uh, it, it means uh, on average, our customer uh, may suffer less than half a minute per year. Uh, on Hong Kong, uh, uh, on the whole, it's less than three minutes. So I don't see anybody in this room heard about uh, you know, safety issues, uh, about the uh, electricity supply in Hong Kong in general. So the third one is on prices, affordability. Uh, I, I need a bit of, to explain. Uh, this is based on domestic uh, tariff uh, on the bulk of about 275 unit consumption per month on, on uh, average household. So this is, you, you may seem this is low, but account for about 50% of the domestic customer in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong Electric, $1, and as compared with Singapore, London, and so on, they are much, much higher. In terms of affordability, affordability in general uh, is talking about 2 to 3% in, in uh, most of the uh, markets in the world. In Hong Kong's case, the number is 1.77%. Uh, this is much lower than the other jurisdiction. Hong Kong's size is only 1.6%. This is uh, exceptionally low as compared with elsewhere. The fourth uh, uh, objective target, target government uh, uh, objective is on environmental performance. So uh, our, our comment on this one is from 2008 to 2014, the three categories of air emission from Hong Kong Electric is significantly lower than the government's cap by 40 to 90 percent. So this is uh, quite, quite a remarkable uh, achievement. So today, power plant emission is no longer the key concern of Hong Kong. Uh, this slides talk about how, how does the uh, overseas market performing. Uh, it, it talks about affordability, reliability, and customer choices. And the outcome is a mixed bag. Uh, you know, you're talking about choices. Uh, you know, there's a, I, I understand there's some economic professors here. They know very well that to, to measure the com competition or the market concentration, the Economic 101 tells us there's a HXI. HXI stands for uh, Huffendale Hochschmann Index that measures the concentration of the market. So if you want to have uh, effective competition in a market, in any market, you need at least five competitors, uh, at least. So in the case of Hong Kong, I dare to say, 
given our limit, very small size, very, very uh, electricity, very capital intensive, the chances of having five competitors in Hong Kong, I dare to say, is impossible. So affordability is another, uh, we all talk about quite a few times, uh, how low our prices compare with uh, the other markets. Reliability we talk about, and customer choices, uh, Paul already mentioned about some uh, examples in the world. I can, own, you know, I've been working on this uh, in Australia and the UK. The five largest, uh, six largest retailer in the UK. In last year, 2014, the number of customer complaint is seven to 28 per hundred customer. So the number is quite striking. I think if that number comes up in Hong Kong, I don't. I wonder how customer council can manage so many complaints in, in, in this situation. So not, competition does not have a root in Hong Kong in the electricity market because the chance of having num five numbers or at least three, four numbers of competitor in a very capital intensive and long life assets, it is virtually quite impossible. And another overseas experience on the process. Uh, we used to call, say, the regulation, privatization, and competition, this all happened when a country trying to liberalize the market. Hong Kong has been a, you know, privately owned business uh, from start off. For example, in Hong Kong Electric, this year is 125 years history. From day one, we have been a private company providing the service all single-handedly to the uh, consumer on the island. So in another place, if you want to have, you know, uh, deliberization, desegregation, and then with choices for customer, it takes a very, very long process uh, and tedious and very costly. And I will talk about the result later on. So number two is tariff may not be lower, this is government, government's words, but you can see uh, the chart that's shown by the government. How does we compare with other jurisdictions like Singapore, London, Sydney, and New York? Reliability, again, this is, uh, we talk about quite a few times. The last one is choices. Uh, as I said, the chances of competition in Hong Kong in the electricity market is virtually impossible. But even though we chance, with, with choices for customer, it may not give you the result. The, the indication in other jurisdictions have already proven it. So are we ready in 2018? So the government virtually say impossible. So that's come out, coming out on the next slide. So how do we do it if we, there, there's no um, uh, change in the regulation? So the government talking about uh, are we doing more interconnection between the two power company or doing interconnection with uh, uh, Southern Greek, for example. But all these involve very huge sum of capital investment. If we are talking about interconnect with uh, Southern Greek, <coughs> we are talking about tens of billions. And tens of billions before, you know, delivering any advantages, the cost of electricity on average basis has to increase by 10 to 20 percent. So this is quite a significant number. Again, in the, uh, <clears throat> the third slide on this uh, ready or not in 2018, uh, the government basically has said no way. So the f future one is the government say uh, the scheme of control that has served us well and it will stay. Now the government want us to you know, comment on whether some of the features of the SCA should be changed. The first one obviously is on how to uh, uh, regulate the, uh, the uh, service provider on the rate of return. So today we have this uh, re return on uh, asset and uh, other, other jurisdiction, they're using cap regulation, uh, using the, the so-called famous CPI minus six, but incidentally, cap regulation has changed now. In, in other parts of the world, initially they use cap, they now sm already move on to uh, what we call revenue cap. They are not using price cap anymore. <clears throat> uh, this is the D 
details of the uh, SCA which the government asked people to respond. Uh, I think Paul already mentioned uh, every one of them. Uh, the obvious the government like to advertise uh, more and more on this permitted rate of return. I think this is the key, actually, the key argument or the contentions between uh, the regulator and ourselves on this rate of return. Uh, again, you know, the asset that we are putting in are very capital intensive. For putting a new unit of generator, we are talking about three to four billion dollars, live in 30, 35 years, and these are all illiquid assets. They can't be moved. They can't go to other place. You know, the value of the asset once in store is dropping down year by year on a straight line basis. And there's no chance of revaluating and the return, if the return rate keep on the same, the return amount in absolute term is still decreasing. It is very different from other investment. If you invest in a property or invest in a, in a factory, the asset value in the book may be decreasing, but actually the potential of increasing the asset value if you're owning a property, history tells us this is always increasing. And you may, in, in the first few years, you're only having four or 5% return on asset, but going up after the uh, revaluation plus the increasing of rents and rates and so on, the return will increase more, much more in the, in the further end, but in our case, we are dropping very substantially towards the end. So this is a, a very difficult and academic question to <coughs> debate in public. I think we better leave it when we talk to the government with the four door closed. <laughs> now the film makes, I don't want to uh, repeat this. So um, I only touch on the renewable energy. Uh, I think everybody likes to have renewable energy uh, in, in, in anywhere you live. Uh, they, 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 I, I think I'm instrumental, I can say I'm instrumental to start the commercial wind, wind farm in Australia. So doing individual distributed wind farm or solar panel, it is not necessarily economical. I'll give you one example in Australia. Is, uh, there, there, there is a report just issued less than a month ago, I think three, two, three weeks ago. The, the whole community in Australia spent $14 billion for all the rooftop PV. And the benefit that all this installation get is only nine billion of offset electricity char charges. So that means the, this 14 billion at the, end of, on, and in the end of the day, all customer contribute to this 14 billion. The saving is only nine billion. Why? Because the subsidy is too generous in one hand to the efficiency of those individual solar panels, even though the sunshine in Australia is much better than Hong Kong, still overall e efficiency is low. So in the case of Hong Kong, whether we can have rooftop, I don't have a chance because I don't have roof myself. So I don't believe many of you have a rooftop to, to put a, a PV panel. But nevertheless, we support, we strongly support uh, you know, institutions and those have, uh, have the luxury of a roof, please, they should install that. But if you're talking about for the community as a whole, I believe a commercial size, RE is a better way to go forward. We have proved ourselves a commercial wind, uh, wind, wind, wind turbine and commercial uh, PV, they are much more efficient than individual one add up together. I have finished the, the 19 slide that government has uh, used to um, you know, talk to the, uh, their stakeholders and I made my comment and come to the five uh, slides that summarize the views of Hong Kong Electric. Again, this based on the, the charts below is again government information, the raw data come from government's consultation paper. In the, in the case of Singapore and Hong Kong Electric, the outages per customer per year is about less than a minute in our case, about 0.6 of a minute. In uh, other parts of the world, for Sydney, it's talking about CBD Sydney, it's not Sydney as a whole. CBD Sydney is 16 minutes, New York, 19 minutes, 
and London, 32 minutes. As Paul already mentioned, we have been uh, ranked by the World Economic Forum in the year 2013 and 14. Uh, we are uh, the number seven in the uh, global competitiveness, but Hong Kong have two good things and one bad thing. One good thing is very good infrastructure in Hong Kong, but most important of all, number one in quality of supply of electricity. The best thing is no innovation. So this is a very fair comment, and we are proud of this uh, record. And two, you're talking about uh, tariff again, Hong Kong Electric $1 for the same basis, Singapore 1.6 time, London twice, New York and Sydney 2.4 time. But on top of that, Hong Kong Electric has declared that the, we will freeze our tariff from 2014 to 2018. No jurisdiction have ever experienced these promises. I hope I can honor this promise up to 2018. And on what basis we can do that? You look at from 20, 2008 to 2014, in these six years, we only increase our tariff by 5.9%. But in the same period of time, we double the volume of gas we use. The first contract of gas is less than $5, $4 something per, 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 per unit of uh, heat. The second contract, same amount, we pay five times more. The highest we pay, $22. But within that six year, we still only increase 5.9%. And then we have another five year, followed by five year tariff freeze. So this is a very remarkable performance, I would say. I, I, I dare to challenge any other company that can perform the same or close to that. Performance on uh, 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 emission performance, uh, we have consistently outperformed the government give the target given to us. And summarize, we pass all these four policy objectives with flying colors. This is the last slide for me. I think the objective regarding tariffs, affordability, safety, reliability, and environment protection, we think we are fully achieved. And the SCA, the current SCA has been done. You remember, government conducted two rounds of consultation in year 2005 and 2006. Very thorough, very extensive uh, consultation. And more than a year and a half negotiation come up with today's SCA. I think the SCA has successfully balanced the interests of the consumer and the power company. Now, this scheme of control is only 57 pages. When it started th uh, 35 years ago, only 23 pages. A lot of changes and so on. But one thing very important in this scheme of control agreement the recital B and the recital C. The, re the recital B is a long paragraph stating out the obligation of the power company. And it's recital C talking about the remuneration, the reward that we can receive by delivering all those objectives. So this is a very, very important two paragraph. That means it has to be balanced. When you look at the regulations in other states, in Australia and UK, the inner cover of the regulation will tell you what they want to achieve. They only mention about the customer interest. But at the end of the day, in those jurisdictions, their performance is much inferior than Hong Kong. So I think this works better for Hong Kong. So the last thing I want to say is, do we need to change? Why change? So my conclusion is keeping it unchanged is a better way out. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much to both uh, Paul and CT. Um, some interesting topics for some further discussion. We've got around 15 minutes or so. If uh, folks have got any questions, we'd very much welcome those. If you'd like to ask a question, we'll have a gentleman with a roving mic to come and uh, collect you. Um, but could you please state your name and your affiliation? That would be very helpful. So who's going to break the spell of silence? <laughs> Sir. What would happen if the government mandate the uh, return rate of uh, 6 to 8%? Uh, I believe Wong uh, Gumsing have mentioned it uh, uh, sometime, somewhere a call, right? What would you forecast? CT? Oh, thank you. Uh, Honorable SKC. Uh, yes, the uh, Secretary for the Environment has been talking about um, people's uh, response to him that they favor a lower rate of return. As I said, we are talking about uh, what do we want. And on the other hand, I represent the power company. What do we want? So it will be a quite a tough negotiation going forward. And <clears throat> the government has a lot of work to do to convince the investors that is the right thing to do. Uh, at this juncture, I don't believe we will accept that. Thank you. Paul, any supplement? Yeah, I think uh, it's too early to comment on this because uh, at the end of the day, we feel that this should be a, a basket of elements to be considered and that the return is just one of the number. But our uh, overarching principle is uh, the return must be uh, reasonable that can attract sufficient investment for this long-term investment. I think uh, we have to emphasize that. We talk about our asset is uh, 30 to 60 years asset life, very capital intensive, a uh, lot movable, and, uh, and uh, it has a sort of a, a value that cannot be easily uh, monetized by other means. So. We, all these factors will need to be considered in deciding this uh, return. That's uh, our view. Thank you. Um, CT, you just identify yourself and yeah. Uh, C.W. Cho from City University of Hong Kong. I just follow up the questions. Actually, the Consumer Council, in the submission to your electrical panel on economic development, it states that a rate of return anything more than 6% would be unfair to the consumers because the consumers bear the key business risk as well as the cost. Uh, that would put you more pressure on that. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Uh, Paul, I'm going to get you there first this time. <laughs> OK, uh, fair chance. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, when we look at the risk, we have to look at uh, whether really uh, the consumer are bearing all the risk. And, uh, I mentioned earlier about this uh, long asset life and also this uh, capital intensive. And the key point is uh, we have this uh, record review once every 10 years. And uh, every time it come up, is we talk about lowering the return. And every time it come up, is talking about introducing competition. So you can see that there's a huge record risk there because uh, our asset life is say 50 years, let's take the average. At every 10 years, you have to subject to a review, and that is totally uncertain. And you just don't know whether you will continue you to carry on or whether you can continue to have the same return. So that is just one of the many risks. Of course, there are other risks like the interest rate. We all know that the interest rate had only one direction, is to go up. Now, it's of course very low. You can say that you have sort of a 9.99 percent, this is too high. But not too long ago, I think we remember the interest rate had gone up to about 20 percent or something like that. So if you have a 20 percent interest rate, do you still want to invest on a 9.99 percent? And with so much risk, there are other many, many risks, environmental performance. Although we are sort of so proud of saying that we can achieve the environmental performance continuous reduction in the emission. But actually, every day, 
we are sweating in our power station to control the emission. Because if we don't meet the emission cap, we go to jail. This is true. This is stated in the ordinance. And likewise, on the reliability, if we cannot maintain our reliability, nobody will trust us. Nobody will put this important uh, mission of ensuring supply reliability for this very, very high-rise city to us. So you can look at all these risks one by one, and the risk, the risk go on and on. So I think when we talk about the risk that we are bearing, we have to look at a more global perspective to really understand the risk that we are bearing and the return we are uh, enjoying. I think um, we all appreciate that mobility return is likely to be a key issue for discussion. I think both speakers have said this is something that will come up probably later on. I'm conscious of the fact we've only got about 10 minutes left to go and there are many other issues the speakers have mentioned. So. I think if we just uh, maybe forget a little bit about the permitted return for a second and just give <laughs> other people the chance to see if there are any questions they want to ask. Colin. Uh, Colin Tam, uh, Board of M Chairman and uh, Chairman of Crystal Vision Energy. Uh, with all due respect, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that the return is a key, it, it, it's a very important issue. So I'm going to take one quick comment so it won't use too much of time. Right? Uh, but I think it's popular for, for everybody to say it should be lower, right? But we ought to know that this is a long-term uh, commitment. So last time when they set the current return, for example, is based on a portfolio, a basket of investment already made at that time. And this investment goes on. So it's like, you know, investor at that time or the consumer at that time is, is, is you know, right, buying a, a, a savings bond, right? so that the investor of both company are putting money into a saving account that's supposed to return, receive this interest rate for 20, 30 years. Now, you know, 10 years later, you say, well, now because the current interest rate on the current market goes down, and now I want you to get less. I don't think that's very fair neither. So in all respect, you know, and I've been in the power industry for 40 years, and I've been on a regulated commission uh, commissioner, you know, rate regulated environment in the U.S. for 20 years and in China for 20 years. When I built a power plant in 1993, you know, the Chinese government have to sign a 20 years take or pay contract. And there's no reduction in the return. It's fixed for the 20 years, you know, right? So, so I think that we need to think both ways. Okay, thank you. Edmund? Thank you, Edmund Leung, former chairman of the Energy Advisory Committee. Uh, I understand quality has a price. The higher the quality, the more you have to pay. I understand in Hong Kong, our reliability is top quality, probably 100 times better than other cities. Uh, when I was chairman, a question was asked of me. Uh, supposing the two power companies are willing to drop their quality by a little bit, say, reduce it from 100% to to 80% to reliability, still miles ahead of other countries and cities. Uh, would there be any reduction in price? Any comment from our experts over there? CT? This is a very tricky question, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think when we, as an as a executive of a power company, we have to balance the interests of the customer and the investors. I think this is the key thing in the whole scheme of control agreement. This is the success, why Hong Kong is so successful in the power industry than many other jurisdictions, because it is a fair uh, treatment for both the investors and the customer. The customer enjoy very low interruption of supply, very good service. I did mention, I mentioned about the, uh, in the UK, the complaint is seven to 28% of the customers. But what is our complaint number in 2014? You may not believe me, zero. So that is the service that we provide. Now when we talk about reliability, the Strength of the infrastructure, of course, bear very important uh, 
element. But more importantly, is the spirit of the contract and the passion of the people in the power industry. They want to do well in delivering the good service, good reliability. And I need to go back to the rail of return thing. I can't escape that. The measurement of whether the rail is good or bad, right or wrong, depend on the result, the result management. We want to manage our employees' result. We want to manage our business result. You look at the result. If the result that we have cheap, relatively speaking, very much higher reliability, very good surface, zero compared to 7 to 28%, how can you say the rate of return is high? I like Colin's point that we experienced that. When we, uh, uh, five years ago, uh, six years ago, we have a rate of return of 13.5, for example. All our business case based on that. And then suddenly it dropped to 9.99. Again, we have to bear that. But if we are now investing, keep on investing, and the rate can keep on dropping, who else will invest? Because if you put the same money in other, other uh, portfolio, the result can be better. And there's no much hustle. You know, everybody can point finger to the rate you are enjoying. That is a very important point. If our tariff is high compared with others, so if no good, you have every right to complain that we are not delivering the service and the rate of return is high. But if we compare with elsewhere, one thing you have to understand, the rate of return in other electricity business elsewhere, they are only on network business. They do not cover generation. For network business, you are talking about incremental investment. You don't have a lump, a very lumpy investment. You're talking about addition of kilometer of circuit, one circuit, two circuit, like that. But once we start putting in a uh, generator, now we are talking about if we want to meet 2020 result, we have to commit $7 billion from now to 2020. Maybe see if we have different number, certainly bigger number than us. But if we are facing this situation, what shall we do? And you are talking about risk. Hong Kong Electric has been, for the last 12, 12 13 years, we are under recover in our fuel costs. This is our commitment to help the customers to, you know, to level out the cost they have to bear each year. So there is a huge risk. And one year, our, our fuel cost may be two, two billion, three billion, and the highest can be go up to six billion. We have to bear that one. We don't think we have no risk. Thank you. Paul, do you want to supplement? Yeah, I think I will just a quick remark on uh, Edmunds uh, quality. Uh, I think uh, many people will ask this question whether we are 99999. If we can drop one nine, so would it still be a good number because it's still high? Then can we lower the tariff? But for this particular question, we have consulted many, many stakeholders and uh, conducts uh, several uh, independent survey, and everybody point out that. Hong Kong deserve to have such high reliability. And that go back to my first question about this uh, high-rise vertical city of Hong Kong. It's not just about inconvenience. We are talking about safety. Because if you, we, uh, maybe some of you have heard our comment, 50%, 50%, of Hong Kong people actually live on 15th floor above. So imagine if you are living a safe 30 floor. And if you do have a heart attack, I don't think anybody can save you. They have estimate around is 10 or 12 floor is the maximum that you can, people can save you in time because, uh, you know, to carry you down uh, through the staircase is not easy. So we are talking about safety issue rather than just financial issue. And safety is priceless. Well, I think uh, I have a very clear direction from the President of the Chamber. The American Chamber always insists that events finish on time. And we have about two minutes left. 
What I would like to do is to make an appeal to you all. Hopefully today, you have found the input very useful. I know it's prompted a little bit of debate today, and that's good, and that's right, and that's proper. You just have two weeks left to make your views heard. This is a pivotal time for Hong Kong. It will change the structure of the way that electricity is supplied in the next 10 to 15 years. Please have your say. Whatever you think, please have your say. Get your response into the Environment Bureau by the end of the month. Now, could you all please join me in thanking our two speakers today, Paul Poon and C.T. Wang. Now we have two small gifts, and they are small gifts, so I have to manage their <laughs> expectations. So CT, Paul, could you please uh, take uh, on behalf of the American Chamber a small token of our appreciation? What Paul? is the rate of return? <laughs> <laughs> small. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I've just about made it, I think, with one minute to spare. Thanks again for coming. Uh, on behalf of the American Chamber, it's very much appreciated. Thank you.